uh, our name is important, uh, but people, more than our name, they remember what we do. They remember our testimony, our character, and our actions. And so this morning, uh, we'll look at a neighbor with no name. And we're going to talk about Christian charity, Christian love, and uh, neighborliness. And we'll begin with verse number 30, but I want to talk first about the context of what we're picking up in this passage with the Good Samaritan. Uh, Because uh, it's important, it's been said that uh, a text without context is just a pretext. And sometimes I've struggled all week long reading over this passage and uh, looking at what people believe about this passage, uh, trying to find what the actual context and purpose of Jesus sharing the account of the Good Samaritan is. And you have to kind of go back to verse number 25 before Jesus goes into the story of the Good Samaritan to understand what's happening. And there's a lawyer who is trying to uh, trap Jesus. Uh, I don't know that he's asking this question sincerely, but he's, he's asked an important question, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And that's a wonderful question to ask. It's the most important question that anybody can ask in life. What do I have to do to have eternal life? And um, Jesus responds to him, and he says, well, what's written in the law? This man is a, this man is a lawyer. Uh, he is a scribe. He, he knows the Torah inside and out. And so he responds by quoting from the Shema, Deuteronomy, uh, where he says, uh, love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Uh, and then he adds the part, uh, and thy neighbor is thyself from the book of Leviticus, from the law. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Uh, if you want to have eternal life, you're right. Do these things and you'll have eternal life. And you say, well, wait, is Jesus saying that good works gets us to heaven? No, that's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus, um, he knew where this conversation was going with this lawyer. And so he says, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, what does the law say? And he says, well, you have to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll have eternal life. Why did Jesus say that? Well, what is the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law we found out in the book of Romans is to show us that we can never keep the law. We can never gain eternal life by keeping the law. The law is our uh, schoolmaster. It's our taskmaster. It points out to us that we are never good enough to do all of those things. So Jesus says, yes, if you can can keep the entire law, if you can do all of these things, if you can love God perfectly, if you can do all of this, you'll have eternal life. And the answer is, can we do those things? No, we can't. And so Jesus says, you've answered right. And so the man says, uh, in his mind, probably, he's thinking, well, you know, I love God. And I love my neighbor as myself. Jesus says, uh, do this, and thou shalt live. And then in verse 29, uh, the reason we get the account of the Good Samaritan is because the the scribe, this lawyer, he then asks Jesus this question. He says, well, who is my neighbor? Uh, It says in verse 29, wanting to justify himself. Wanting to, you know, make sure that, yeah, I have done all of these things. I've loved God perfectly. I've loved my neighbor as myself. And he says, who is my neighbor? And so then Jesus begins to tell this account of the Good Samaritan. Because this lawyer, he probably thought as long as he was taking care of those people that he cared about, he was in good standing with God. And so, as a Jew... If you wanted to to define who your neighbor was, the Jews had a very narrow definition of who their neighbor was. And we're going to kind of lay this out for a minute, but you'll understand why it's important as we walk through this passage. And so they have a very narrow interpretation of who their neighbor is. And the reason they define their neighbor in such narrow terms is so this lawyer can do what he's attempting to do. What? Justify himself. So if, if we really narrow down the parameters of what our neighbor is, then we can say, well, yeah, I've loved my neighbor as myself. 
And Jesus is going to point out to this lawyer and to the rest of the religious people in the room, they haven't done as good as they thought that they have done. Uh, you know, this lawyer, he wasn't one of those guys that went around um, like one of my heroes, Mr. Rogers. I don't think this, this lawyer, Josh, he didn't go around singing, you know, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? And I always love the part, you know, where he, he would kick off a shoe, you know, and take it. and runs it. How many of you like Mr. Rogers? Neighborhood, yeah. You're too young, Jessica, aren't you? Now I feel old. But Jesus, through this account, he's going to redefine the people that we're supposed to demonstrate Christian charity, Christian love to. Uh, because true Christian love, is it only supposed to be shown to the people around us that can show love in return to us? No. We're supposed to love those who never love us back. Why? Well, because Christ loved us. What does the book of Romans say? While we were yet sinners, God commendeth his love toward us. He proved his love. He demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, we have nothing to offer Christ back, but Christ died for us. And so the teaching of Christ in this account, he's challenging not just this lawyer and the Jewish people in the room, but us today, that we need to step out of our comfort zone as Jesus did, and help anyone and everyone around us who has a need. And it was, I mean, it's radical what Jesus suggests in this passage of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10. Now, there are those, this is what I want to say, there are those who believe that this account of the Good Samaritan is a parable. Many times you'll see uh, people talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And what is a parable? Well, you know, one of the definitions we always hear is it's, a, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's, it's sort of a fictional account. Jesus used parables in his earthly ministry. He would tell stories for a divine purpose, and there would be something to glean from these stories that Jesus would tell, but they didn't necessarily actually take place. And there are many, many people, as you read through commentaries, I read a ton of books this week on the Good Samaritan. There's a lot of people who believe that this is one of the parables that Christ told. Now, I tend to believe uh, that this is an actual account. I don't think this is a parable. I think this really happened. I think the Good Samaritan was a real individual uh, for several reasons, as you can study. I don't know that it's important we dig into all of that this morning. You can believe it's a parable. You can believe it's a real account. I don't think it, it really matters. I wouldn't break fellowship with anybody over how they choose to believe this. But I think that it really is a true account. As Jesus is talking to these, this Jewish crowd to turn a Samaritan, as we'll see later, into a hero wouldn't have really served Jesus much good to just make up a story about a Samaritan being a hero. Uh, I think that they probably could have just rejected it and said, well, this is just a made-up story. Uh, they, they could have turned it down. But I think that what we see here this morning is a real account. And I think this lawyer and I think the religious people in the room, I think they were familiar with what Jesus is going to talk about. And I think that's why it had such impact. But you can believe either way on it. Uh, but as we go through it this morning, the other thing that we'll try not to do, and whether you believe this is a real account or whether you believe this is a parable, is I want to try to stay away from allegorizing the story, making things, uh, spiritualizing things. You know, you'll have people that say, well, the, the lost man represents this, and the, the priest and the Levite represent this, and the, uh, you know, the Good Samaritan is a picture of Jesus, and the way he comes does this, and the inn where he takes the Good Samaritan, or where the Good Samaritan takes the injured man represents the church, and you've got all these pictures symbolizing all these different things. Uh, I don't think that's the primary interpretation of this passage. You know, every single passage that we have, and that's why we go back to verse 25 to read this context. Every scripture has one primary interpretation. What is the interpretation of this scripture? He says, how do I get to heaven? You've got to love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? Jesus is going to directly answer that question and define who our neighbor is. This is about doing good, going out of our comfort zone to love people. Uh, this man wouldn't have known about the, the inn representing the church and all of these different things. I don't think Jesus had that in mind. Now, can we make some applications from this that will help us? Yes. So we'll try to make some applications like that, but we're going to try to leave this account in its actual context and with its actual interpretation, who is my neighbor loving other people? And so we then pick up this account in verse number 30. Jesus answering, he says, who is my neighbor? Well, he says, a certain man 
went down from Jericho, uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among th thieves. They stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three? Jesus has finished the story, and he's now directing his question back to the lawyer. Which of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, the lawyer, he that showed mercy on him. And he's correct. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Now we could summarize this entire story uh, into three statements about people. And I think that it really fits. This is an original with me. Uh, this is something I heard from Adrian Rogers. I've mentioned it when we've gone through this passage in the past. I don't know if it was original with Adrian Rogers or not, but whoever came up with it, I think they're right. If you want to summarize the story of the Good Samaritan, it's about people. It's that some people spend their life beating others up. Some people spend their life passing people up. And some spend their life helping people up. And the choice is ours to decide which one of those categories we want to live in. That's what Jesus is trying to tell this lawyer. You can either beat people up, you can pass people up, or you can help people up. A lot of times the lost people, they spend all of their lives in category number one, just beating people up. A lot of times Christians, believers, people that will be in this room this morning, they spend their lives in category number two, passing people up. You can be a Christian and you can walk by people with needs and never look at them through the eyes of Jesus with a heart of compassion and do anything for them and still be a believer. But after we study this this morning, the goal of every single person, the prayer of our heart should be that God helps us to be category number three, one who goes through life helping people up like the Good Samaritan. And you don't have to have a position uh, you don't have to be a pastor, a preacher, an evangelist, a missionary, a Sunday school teacher. You don't have to have some position or title or anything like that to be one of these individuals. This guy in Scripture, we're, we're never told. He's just known as the Good Samaritan. And the guy who's beat up, we don't know anything about him. It's just a certain man. But first, I want you to notice this morning the gravity of the situation. Uh, we're told very little about the victim. Uh, we don't know what he was doing on this journey. We don't know why he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. But we're told that he was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he got into trouble. And this story begins as a story of ruin. I mean, things are looking very bad. It's, it's, uh, it's grave and dire, the circumstances that this Jewish man finds himself in. And I want you to look at the direction that he was going. How does it start out by, by telling us? It says that a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, when we use the words, uh, we're going down from somewhere, you know, I'm going to go down to Little Rock. We would say that we're going uh, down to Little Rock for what purpose? Because Little Rock is south of us. We usually use those terms. We're going up north, down south, back east, out west, right? Those are kind of the way that we think about things. And so you might think that uh, Jerusalem, he's going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, so Jericho must be south of Jerusalem. But it's actually not. Jerusalem is southwest of Jericho. We've got a map here. I think the reason that Jesus said the man went down to Jericho is based on the fact of the altitude. Yes. Jerusalem's a very high city. It sets up. It's a 17-mile road. 
uh, this still road. Uh, my dad's been on it. I've seen a lot of people who have traveled this road. Uh, they'll take you. They'll stop at the inn of the Good Samaritan, a place where they believe uh, this inn was actually located where this story took place. And you'll know, notice from Jerusalem down to Jericho is very mountainous. You drop it 3,600 feet in elevation from Jerusalem to Jericho. So he was literally going down this road. It's very curious, very windy. He went down. Uh, 17 miles long. It's a very dangerous path. Uh, it was known in this day and for centuries later, it was called the Bloody Way. Uh, because of all these steep curves, there were limestone caves. There was a lot of places for thieves and robbers to hide. Uh, and you took your life in your hands when you traveled this path. So it's very dangerous. And that's what happened to this man. He fell among thieves, Scripture tells us. Uh, and you see what they did. They, they, they beat him. They stripped him. Uh, they stoned him. They kicked him. Uh, they take his clothes. They take his wealth. They, they nearly take his life from him. There he is in a pool of blood, dying, uh, half dead. These are grave circumstances, aren't they? And if we wanted to make some application from that to our lives, we could. Uh, it is similar in many aspects to human nature. When you see in Scripture the words, somebody went down, you know, uh, when they went down to Egypt. Was it usually a good thing when someone went down to Egypt? You remember Jonah? Jonah went down to Joppa. Jonah went down into the ship. There's usually some pictures there of going down being associated with something negative. Now, that's not the actual uh, interpretation of the passage, but we can make an application there. That in our lives, when the devil promises us something good, we can be headed along in life, and the devil can promise us something good, uh, but you can be sure that his plan is to give you the opposite. Uh, he says, you know, do this. You remember Adam and Eve? Uh, eat the fruit. You'll have all sorts of knowledge. Things will be wonderful. Uh, it's always the opposite, what the, the devil promises, right? The Bible tells us that Jesus said that uh, he was a murderer from the beginning. He says there's no truth in him. Uh, he's a liar. He's the father of lies. So you can be assured that in life, Satan's plan is to give you the opposite of what he promises. If, if the devil promises something to you that you think is going to be joyful, you can be sure that when the devil promises joy, you end up with sorrow. You can be sure that when the devil promises you freedom, his goal is to bind you. He's always going to do the opposite. And following his deception, following the lies of Satan, uh, is going to deplete you of joy and peace and the blessings that God has for you uh, in our daily lives. And then in the context of the scripture, just like this man was beaten, bruised, bloodied, you know, there's a lot of people around us. There'll be people in this room this morning that are wounded in some way. They may be wounded emotionally this morning. We deal with people every single week. Somebody that's sitting next to you on a pew this morning may be wounded emotionally. You'll deal with somebody this week in your family, at your job, that's wounded emotionally. We hear about, you know, broken homes. That goes back to things that Satan tries to destroy in our lives. He's the cause of broken homes. Homes that are divided by Satan. Uh, we hear about uh, victims of abuse. We hear about children that are abused emotionally and physically. We deal with children like that that we pick up and bring in on our church van. People that come to a church looking for people to love them and care for them. We deal with people that have problems. There'll be people who are here this morning that are, that are wounded financially. They may be out of a job. They may be looking for a job. We'll have people, though, who are hurting. There are going to be people who are here this morning at church. They need love. There'll be people that you interact with this week that need love. Just like this hurting man in the story this morning. So the, the man on the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho, I mean, he's, he's super close to death, it sounds like. This is a grave situation. It says, uh, they departed, leaving him half dead. 
It's a grave situation. I like what Rod Mattoon said as he was talking about this passage. He said, like these thieves, sin robs us of blessing and leaves us battered, bruised, and bleeding. The final outcome is death. That's where it ends up leading, isn't it? Uh, Satan's ultimate goal for us is death. Uh, the Bible tells us that when we're, when we're tempted, when we allow our flesh to draw us away from the things of God, uh, sin, when it is conceived, when it finally brings forth all of its fruit, the end of it is death. Uh, John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus told us about the devil. He said, uh, the thief cometh to uh, steal and to kill and to destroy. We're told in the book of 1 Peter, as believers, we're to be sober, we're to be watchful, we're to be vigilant, we're to be circumspect in the things that we do in life. Why? Because we have an adversary, the devil. He's walking around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We do have an adversary. But those of us who are saved... Uh, we've had a death-to-life experience. I mean, we've been raised to new life in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about how we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, but Christ has quickened us. He's made us alive. Praise the Lord for that. So we get back to this man here on the road. He's fighting for his life. And what's the reaction to this, to this uh, tragic scene? Uh, surely somebody's going to come by to help this man. That takes us to the second thing I want you to see this morning. That's the greater sinners. As the story continues, here he is lying half dead. We have a victim. He can't help himself. He's not getting up. He's not going anywhere. It reminds me uh, of a story I read about a CBS reporter many years ago uh, was mugged outside of his New York City apartment. Uh, he was beaten. He was left laying in an alley beside his apartment in the wee hours of the morning. Fully lucid, he was awake, but he, he couldn't move, he couldn't do anything, he'd been beaten badly. And he told the story of how people walked by and looked at him and did nothing for him. And he laid there for hours before somebody finally came by and helped him. That's exactly how this man is this morning. And so here come a couple of men, one a priest and one a Levite. This is fantastic. We have, we have the people of God coming. We have the religious people coming. These people are going to reach out and they're going to show compassion on this man, Right? No, no. We see a real callousness in this priest and this Levite. I mean, these two people, I mean, they represent the clergy. They represent the men of God. They represent the, the worship of the Lord. This is the religious people. These are the people that you think are going to come by and help. The problem is they're really more true to life, our life, than we would care to own up to. If you look this morning with open eyes and you're honest, you'll probably see yourself, at least from time to time, in the priest and the Levite that walk by this guy. They pass him up without helping. How often do we pass up opportunities to help someone who's been robbed and left for dead spiritually? How many times do we pass up somebody, those people we talked about that, that will be at church this morning, that you'll interact with this week, who are wounded emotionally, uh, physically, spiritually, all of these different ways? How many times are there opportunities for us to help people, but we pass by them? Now keep in mind, who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to a Jewish man, a Jewish lawyer, the scribe. And I think as Jesus is telling this story, he lays out the priest that passes by and how he represents the upper echelon of the religious leaders of Israel. And he, he points out the Levite, man who uh, helped with the religious ceremonies and things like that. He kept the law as well. Uh, Jesus points out, you know, you've got these two Jews. They pass by this, this man. They, these are supposed to be the men who keep the law for God. And they've passed by. And you can imagine this lawyer, he's probably thinking as Jesus is telling this story, how tragic that is that there would be religious individuals. Because he's asked, who is my neighbor? And they're trying to define who their neighbor is as Jewish individuals. Jesus is saying, this Jewish man did not help a Jewish man who was hurt. Somebody that was put directly in their path. They had to walk around the opportunity. They had to turn a blind eye to what was going on and refuse to help somebody. We ask ourselves, is there people that God has put in our path, perhaps even repeatedly, that we just kind of walk by and ignore? 
It could be a store clerk. How many times do we interact with people on a weekly basis? You may stop and get a drink from the same individual working at a gas station each week. It could be somebody at a drive through You begin to interact with these people, a store that you go into, a business that you frequent. You begin to develop relationships with these people. Do you ever look to see, is there a way that I can help these people? Well, I see first here in these greater centers, we have a divine intervention because the Lord, He often sets these appointments up for us and we just aren't prepared to take them. Uh, It tells us in verse number 31, it says, and by chance. Sometimes these are really divine appointments that God has set for us. And we can be like the priest and the Levite and we just go around it. But God had orchestrated. I mean, God knows our steps, right? Job says, He knoweth the path that I take. Uh, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God knows what He's doing in our lives and He may direct our path to go right beside somebody who needs help, who needs compassion, who needs love, who needs to hear about Jesus. And by chance... When we find somebody that has a spiritual need, when we find somebody that has a need that we can meet, and they're put in our path, stop and ask yourself, did God put them here for a reason? Are they put there so I can help them? Then you'll see that there was a deliberate indifference because when we haven't prepared ourselves on purpose, you've got to be ready on purpose. Be alert to the other people's needs. It's easy for us to overlook them. Be alert. Be looking. You may have to go visit the, uh, the spiritual optometrist, right? You may have glasses on this morning. You can see good with your physical eyes, but how's your spiritual vision? We need to get, get those eyes checked. Get our spiritual glasses on. Maybe change those spiritual contacts. I got something in my eye right now. I don't have contacts, but... I can't see very clear out of my right eye. Everything's fuzzy at the moment. That's how we go through life sometimes, right? Everything's just kind of fuzzy. Get your spiritual vision checked. We've got to be wise and good stewards uh, of our physical eyes. We're supposed to take care of them. We're supposed to go get those regular checkups. Make sure that you can see. How do we do with our spiritual vision checkups? Been a while? The two men in Jesus' story, the priest and the Levite, uh, they weren't suffering from a lack of physical vision, were they? They could see this man. They knew he was there. What was their problem? It was a heart problem. Spiritually. They were spiritually blind. They didn't, it wasn't that they just didn't see the need. They saw this man's injuries. They knew the problems. They were sure of it. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the same place, came and looked on him. He looked at him and passed by on the other side. The priest saw, the Levite looked. They had to deliberately choose to be indifferent. Say, you know what? Not not my problem. Um, You know, I'm in a hurry. We ever used that excuse before? Sometimes we can make ourselves feel good. You know, I would stop and have a conversation with this person, but I've really got to be somewhere. I'm I'm in a hurry. I just didn't have time. Uh, I'm not really qualified. You know, maybe if the preacher could talk to so-and-so, they could help them, but I'm not really qualified. It looked too risky. I mean, this is a dangerous road these guys are on. We don't have time to stop here. I mean, obviously this guy ran into some bad dudes. We don't have, I mean, it could hurt us if we stayed here. I can't sacrifice my own life. And it's kind of like it makes us feel better when we come up with some of these excuses. We can kind of feel better about ourselves for a few minutes. But if you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit's got to convict you at some point and, and later you're going to remember those opportunities where you passed somebody by and you could have spoken for the Lord, you could have shown compassion, you could have helped somebody in need, and why didn't I? The Bible talks about, uh, in Matthew chapter 24, that the love of many shall wax cold. Sometimes that's us. We've seen the gravity of this guy's situation. We, we've talked about these greater sinners. Now, this is where Jesus is going, to the Good Samaritan. 
There's a third man on his way to Jericho. The Good Samaritan. And he looked and saw the man's desperate situation, his grave situation. He's, he's looked at it and he saw it. But this man chose to do something about it. I mean, even people who would say that they're not religious, they understand the term Good Samaritan. It's become synonymous with doing something good for somebody. That's how well known this story is that Jesus told. Now, I think as Jesus is telling this story, from what I've read from several different authors, is that these stories would typically, you know, the people in the room, they may be upset with how the religious tier of the Jewish leadership is. I mean, can you believe the priest passed by this guy? Can you believe that this Levite passed by this guy? Uh, yeah, Jesus, he, he's really pointing out how bad some of these religious Jewish leaders are. And so the thinking is that now Jesus is going to show how some Jewish layperson comes by and does what the rest of the Jews will not do and help this man, and the Jew ends up being the hero in this story. This is one of the reasons why I think this is a real account. Because Jesus, all of a sudden, he just takes a dramatic, drastic turn. This would have shocked the people in the room because the guy that he begins to talk about, oh, this is a doubtful candidate. Uh, the Samaritans... They were hated by the Jews. They were looked down on by the Jews. No way does Jesus tell this story to a group of Jewish people and suddenly a Samaritan, people that they wouldn't eat with. They would identify eating with a Samaritan the same as eating pork. I mean, you just don't interact with Samaritans. And suddenly Jesus says, let me tell you about this wonderful Samaritan man. Oh my goodness. He takes a big turn here. You remember there was a time where Jesus, he was traveling somewhere and he told his disciples, boys, we're going to go the uh, short route because it goes through Samaria. We're not going to walk around Samaria. The people of Israel, the Jews, they would choose to walk around Samaria. They didn't want the dust of Samaria to touch their feet. That's how much they hated these people. They were half-breeds. They looked at them. They looked down upon them. Uh, they were racially nowhere near as good as they were. Now, what is the question that this man asked? Who is my neighbor? Jesus is talking about being a neighbor to people. He's defining this. And he gets to this point. We talked about uh, in John chapter 4, you have the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. Samaritan woman. People that nobody else wanted to have a dealing with. But Jesus goes and she finds eternal life because Jesus took time to meet with somebody that didn't look just like he did, that didn't talk just like he did that didn't fit the mold of everybody else around him, but Jesus showed compassion. And the Samaritan man in Jesus' story, oh, this isn't a likely choice. Uh, most would have expected a Samaritan sees a Jew that is hurt. What would a Samaritan, somebody that this man knows that, man, this guy hates me. He should be the one who passes by. He should be the one to go on the other side. I'm not going to help somebody that hates me. And could you imagine, I don't know how lucid this individual was, but could you imagine, he was grateful that somebody stopped to help him. Could you imagine when he found out it was a Samaritan that stopped to help him, that saved his life? This is a doubtful candidate. Uh, but God uses people who are little in their own eyes. You remember King Saul? God used King Saul until there was a time in Saul's life that came uh, and he said, when you were little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? But Saul got, you know, we had that series, uh, Grandma was right after all a year or so ago on parenting. Uh, Grandma would use a phrase called getting too big for your britches. Isn't that what Saul did? And God couldn't use Saul because he got too big for his britches. It, his ego was blown up. His head was too big. David Gibbs, uh, the founder and president of Christian Law Association, one of the quotes that he has that I like in one of his sermons, he says, you can be too big for God to use, but you can never be too small. You can be too big for God to use, but you can never be too small. He was a doubtful candidate, but there was a determined compassion. Uh, he was alert to this victim's need. When the Samaritan saw the wounded man, as he journeyed, verse 33, he came where he was, and he had compassion on him. That's what we're supposed to do. You see, ministry... It starts in your heart rather than with your hands. Um, your hands will end up doing what is in your heart. 
If you figured out why you should serve, you'll figure out how to serve. Sometimes people think, you know, uh, give me something to do, and they get it backwards. We've been guilty of that. But figure out why you should serve. And then it doesn't really matter where it is, you just want to serve. Compassion, it's a decision. Uh, compassion is a driver. The book of Jude says that compassion makes a difference. Then there was a devoted courage. Verse 34, he went to him. He's on this dangerous road. Sometimes we need courage to step into somebody else's life and offer help. Of the, the Great Commission, it starts with the word go. Go therefore. It takes courage to go. It takes courage to speak to people about their need. Uh, one of the most frightening things you can do is ask somebody, hey, uh, do you know if you're going to heaven? Can I tell you about Jesus? You'll, you'll face some fear when you, when you try to share the gospel with people because you're expecting rejection. The righteous, Proverbs tells us, are bold as a lion. So don't let, let fear keep you from going to those in your path who have a need for Christ. And then we see a deliberate charity. He had compassion, he had courage, and he chose to minister with charity to this wounded man. He went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his beast. He took him to the inn. He pays for two days in advance. It costs the Samaritan something to minister to this injured man. When you choose to serve, when you choose to minister, uh, get ready because it's going to require some sacrifice. It's going to cost you something when you try to help people in life. It'll cost you time. It'll cost you energy. It'll cost you money. It's going to cost you. But Paul says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Jesus said, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. It's kind of one of those upside-down things that Jesus would talk about, you know, like the way up is down. And then we see, lastly, a divine commendation. Did the Good Samaritan, did he receive some sort of wonderful award for his act of uh, bravery and courage, his compassion? Well, we don't really know if anybody actually saw this man ministering or not. Uh, we do know the innkeeper became aware of this guy's compassion. We don't know how much more was spent. He says, you know, let me know. Next time I come by, I'll pay up everything. This guy's got a lot of compassion. And there's a lot of things that are probably hidden in this story, things that we don't know about, things that other people didn't know about. But you know who knew about them? The Lord. God knew about it. God sees every time you do something for somebody, uh, you may not get a plaque, you may not get an award, you may not get published on social media, uh, the newspaper may not pick it up, uh, Fox 16 may not run it on the 9 o'clock news this week, but God sees it. Every time you have compassion on somebody, every time you serve somebody, every time you help somebody, every time you share the gospel, the Lord is watching. He doesn't just see the bad things we do. God sees when we sin, but He sees the good. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. You see, ministry is not always public. Ministry is not what just happens on this platform on Sunday mornings. Ministry goes on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, outside of these four walls. And there may be something that you do that nobody ever knows about. But the book of Hebrews tells us that God's always aware because He's not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love which ye have showed toward His name. Don't minister for the eyes of man. Don't do it for the glory. That's where Saul got off track. He started enjoying all of the attention that he was getting. And he became too big for God to use. And so Jesus says to the lawyer, which now of these three thinkest thou was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. And he said, he that showed mercy on him, Jesus said, go and do thou likewise. You see what the Samaritan did, it helps us to better understand what it means to show mercy. It illustrates the ministry of Jesus Christ. He was constantly showing mercy to people who maybe didn't deserve mercy. Did this Jewish man who no doubt hated Samaritans, did he deserve mercy from a Samaritan? But he showed mercy. 
and being an expert in the law. This scribe certainly knew that God required his people to show mercy. And he says, go and do that likewise. Now, we don't know what the lawyer ended up going and doing. There's many who think that he left and left unchanged. Maybe he left and the words of Jesus made a difference in his life. The big question is, who is my neighbor? Wherever people need us, we can be a neighbor. People you interact with this week, it's your neighbor. You come across somebody who's breathing, they're your neighbor. Show mercy. You see, the lawyer, he wanted to discuss neighbor in the beginning. He wanted to discuss it in a very general way. But Jesus forced him to consider a very specific individual that was in need. Jesus didn't want to talk in big generalities. Jesus wanted to focus in on one man that had a need, somebody that he knew. Now, what did this, name, what did this scribe, what did this lawyer do with what Jesus said? Many times as God's people, we don't see as God sees. Last April, that was our missions theme, to see as God sees. That should be the prayer of our heart. We sang that chorus for a few weeks. Maybe we need to sing it again. To see as God sees a world lost in sin. He's left us here. We're to be the hands and feet of Jesus. He's not on earth today. If the hands of Jesus are going to help anybody today, whose hands are it going to be? It's going to be my hands. If the feet of Jesus are going to go somewhere to have compassion on somebody, whose feet is it going to be today? It's going to be my feet. It's going to be your feet. Ask God to help you this week to see who your neighbor is. Make a note, write down the things that you do this week. Nobody else knows about. Thank God for the opportunities that he gives you this week to do something for somebody else. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to study this uh, this passage of the Good Samaritan. Look at the compassion that he shows and that you show to us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have our physical eyes checked up this week, that we would be looking for opportunities to minister and to show mercy to our neighbors that we meet. Help us to make a difference to those around us. Help us to love you the way that we should. We pray that you'd be honored and glorified now as we go into this morning service. Help us to sing out of hearts of love and gratitude for the wonderful mercy and compassion that you've poured out on us. In Jesus' name, amen.